And that means that those people outside were preaching the gospel, if you will, from false motives. You would think that Paul would be upset, or even very, at the very least, he'd be critical about it. But that's not his response at all. Paul says that his situation is turning out for the advancement of the gospel. We might say that, say that Paul is gospel-centric, if you will. He's focused on that. He rejoices that the good news is being preached, whether from good motives or, or bad ones. The gospel is more important, he says, than his reputation or his, his personal comfort. He understands that his imprisonment is for the sake of the gospel, the good news, and he doesn't ask, why is this happening to me? You see, he already knows. Instead, he understands that God is in control. And it may not be his choice. It may not be what he expected. It may not be what he desires. But he realizes that God is in control. Now, it's easy to agree with a, a simple religious statement like, God is in control, isn't it? But you know what? The result of saying that God is in control is, is that I am not in control. You know, we live in our world today and we think, oh my gosh, there's a lot of people in control besides God. But it's actually liberating to realize that we are not in control. It doesn't depend on us. And this is a, a joyful submission, if you will, to the will of God. I might have plans, but that might not be what God's plans are for me. We find those all the time. If I followed my plans, I would not be here standing with you today. I'd be enjoying retirement after I'd become the President of the United States. Or maybe I'd be political something today. I don't know. But that was not God's plan for my life. Although for a, a majority of it, the beginning part of my life, that's where I believe that God led me. You see, Paul understood that God is in control, and that's how he viewed his circumstances. Whatever's going on is about God working in and through me. That's how he viewed it. So let me ask you this. How do we view our circumstances? How do you view your circumstances? Sometimes we're surrounded by people who operate from, from bad motives or just plain just being mean. And I think our natural reaction would be to cry out to God and ask him to intervene. God, you know, stop these people from trying to harm me or trying to profit from religion or, or whatever. But no, Paul doesn't do that. Paul simply rejoices that God's priorities are being accomplished. What about you? Can you find joy in the middle of your difficulties or trials if you have the assurance that God's priorities were taking place? You see, this is a, the call to a deeper maturity in Christ. It's a call to the kind of maturity that acknowledges the fact that our comfort, our safety, are not the highest good in the earth. For me to feel comfortable isn't necessarily the best for God's kingdom. God's kingdom is the highest priority. And Paul demonstrates this as he aligns his priorities with God's priorities. You see, when our priorities align with God's priorities, the result is peace and joy. And whether we're in prison or free, we can experience peace and joy. We can be free as a bird and yet feel very bound, can't we? We can experience peace and joy. Whether relationships or work or finances are going well or whether they're going poorly, we can find peace and joy when we align our priorities with God. You see, Paul was not merely teaching the church in Philippi. He's also teaching us. It's the example that he shows we also find that we need to learn to trust God for the outcome. In verses 19 through 26, Paul says something very unusual and a little mysterious. 
He says that what has happened will turn out for his deliverance. In other words, Paul's faith that God is in control is expressed in terms of outcomes, not events. Catch that? Not in the events that are going on, but in the outcomes. What's being done isn't about the events. The events did not look promising for Paul, but Paul looks beyond the events towards the outcome. And he concludes that the outcome will be glorious. Whether it's in his day or in ours, here are the veritable facts. Sorrow, sickness, and suffering are at large in our world today. But God shows his glory by bringing outcomes that are greater than any sorrow, any sickness, or any suffering. For example, Tertullian is one of the early church fathers, and he lived during the time, a time of persecution. He said these words. He says, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Like Paul, Tertullian was able to look beyond the immediate events. He was filled with the confidence that God would use even difficult events like the death of Christians to do something wonderful, even greater. And this is the part of the glory of God. In the middle of people's weaknesses and wickedness, God is in the world working. He's working his wisdom for our good and for the good of generations to come. Do you believe that? God is working to be good. And in this first chapter of Philippians, Paul was not even concerned about his own personal outcome. He says, I can die, and I can be with Jesus. Or you know what? I can live, which will mean even more fruitful ministry later in my life. I can do either way. Paul does not see his life as something to be preserved, but rather as something to be spent in the service of God's kingdom. You see, that goes back to God's priorities and why we're here and understanding why we're here. This is part of, this is part of the teaching in this chapter. And how... Do you look at your own life? Why should we be afraid of death? It would only mean that we would be with Jesus. The sooner the better. Or if we live, our lives are to be an opportunity to co-labor with God. And to indeed bring blessings to others. And the fourth thing here this morning we want to take a look at is that we need to Receive suffering. These are good titles, aren't they? You're all going, I don't know, Mark. God, this isn't very encouraging at times, you know. Receive suffering. In verses 27 through 30, the Bible teaches us that we can learn how to live as if God is in control by receiving and suffering as something that is sometimes granted by God for us, for the community of faith. Now please hear me on this. No one should go around looking for suffering. I'm not looking for any Eeyores out there. Oh, bother for me. You know, that's not what I'm looking for here at all. That's not what, what Paul's trying to tell us. No one should bring harm to themselves or act foolishly or irresponsibly. Instead, we we order our lives in the way God teaches us to. But if suffering comes as a result of our way of life, and if our way of life is pleasing to God, we should learn how to submit to the will of God, even in suffering. Because where's our reward anyway? Somehow we like to have our cake and eat it too. Our reward's in heaven. Our reward is in the presence of God. And in these last verses, Paul teaches us that we go through whatever happens together. It's an expression not only 
of our individual confidence, but our as our confidence as, as one people, his people. And nearly every pastor that you run into can tell you that churches grow stronger spiritually and bond during times of trouble. It may not be pleasant, but that's what happened. It's a, a community dynamic. The church comes together when things are tough. And Paul actually says that the Philippians unified their bold response to difficulties is a sign of the kingdom of God, its maturity. Paul says something that we, we do not hear quoted very often. He says, For it has been granted to you not only to believe, but to suffer for him. The you in this verse is plural. You all, not singular. Paul saying, you have seen me suffer while I was there with you in Philippi, tossed into prison, and now I'm going through it again. And so are you. You're sharing in my sufferings as well, he says. The Philippians used Paul's imprisonment as a chance for the community to express their love and support for him. And this makes perfect sense to me. We see it time and again as the church responds to, to natural disasters, school shootings, terrorist attacks, or economic hardship. The church draws together during tough times. So receive suffering is what he says. Of course, maybe we should ask ourselves, why wait until tough times to draw together? Why wait until tragedy strikes to show our love and care for those around us? Why wait until things are bad in order to show the love of God? We can be a church that lives in the community and demonstrates community right now, even in the moments of peace and prosperity. Either way, I think the one reason why in difficult times it seems so much is because of the stark difference that it makes. Everybody can be generous and loving and during, during good times. But in the difficult times, he says, reach out. And this is the great lesson of Philippians chapter 1. Individually and as a community, we can demonstrate that God is in control by living as if God is in control. Our actions become the message. Our lives, individually and collect collectively, become the good news. We can demonstrate to the watching world that we confidently believe that God is is in control. God is in control. So how about you? How are you living? Do you live as if God is in control? Or are you maybe like Chicken Little? Remember the story of Chicken Little? The sky is falling. The sky is falling. And some days it seems like the sky is falling. And sometimes it's all just over you. You know? You feel like Eeyore walking around and you just got the, the cloud of rain that's on you. You know? But the truth of the matter is this. 